Uh, well, I should say welcome back to um, second half of our uh, um, study of the Mass. So last year we went over kind of like liturgical reform, like well, actually the history of the Mass, kind of history of liturgical reform. Looked at Sacrosanctum Concilium, which was a document from the Second Vatican Council that called for the reform of the liturgy. Uh, this half of the year we are going to talk about a couple of things. So um, how did we get from Vatican II to what we would recognize as the Mass today at a Novus Ordo parish, so like St. Peter. Um, when that was completed, what was the general reaction to that? And then we will finish the uh, year with uh, four weeks of uh, kind of in-depth look at the actual Mass as it exists today. So tonight we are going to talk about the reform of the liturgy. Um, so we're going to again talk about how we got from Vatican II and the document that we went over that came out of the Second Vatican Council to actually the Novus Ordo, the Mass that we say uh, here at St. Peter and most, uh, most parishes um, across the world that are Roman Catholic. This was originally going to be two parts. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, we obviously missed uh, two weeks ago, so I'm going to try to um, do it in one, but we'll see what happens. Um, so we may have to borrow part of my next week's time as well. So we'll see how far we get. Okay, so uh, again, uh, December 4th, 1963, Sacrosanctum Concilium was promulgated. So the, the second the document of the Second Vatican Council calling for the reform of the liturgy was actually published. Uh, April 3rd, 1969, the Novus Ordo Misae was promulgated. Uh, and then again on November 30th of that same year, they start using the, the, uh, the new right book. Uh, so our goal is to figure out how did we get from a constitution on the sacred liturgy to a revised missal that is used for, uh, for mass. Um, kind of a side note, um, my goal is to focus on primary text coming out of the Vatican uh, that covered the reform. So um, there's lots of secondary things that you could look at and lots of people who have theories and yada, yada, yada. What I just wanted to focus on for here uh, is the actual stuff that came out of the Vatican about the reform of the liturgy. So some, some of the key documents that were issued in those uh, intervening years about the reform of the liturgy. So it started with Sacrum Liturgium, which was a motu proprio issued on January 25th, 1964 by Pope Paul VI. So 52 days after the close of the first session of the Second Vatican Council, after the document was promulgated, um, they kicked off the reform. So again, we go from inks barely dry on the paper to, okay, now how do we actually implement uh, this document out of the Second Vatican Council? Um, and again, recall that um, Sacrosanctum Concilium was, was one of the first documents issued by the council. Um, it was overwhelmingly supported by the bishops. Only four bishops voted against that document at the Second Vatican Council. Uh, and again, part of that was because all of the liturgical reform that had occurred or work that had occurred previous, um, the document itself was very, very, very uncontroversial coming out of the, coming out of the council. So Pope Paul's the doc document here does a couple of things. First, the biggest thing it does is it establishes a commission. And the commission is to focus on uh, implementing in the best possible way the prescriptions of the Constitution on the sacred liturgy. So remember that what the Vatican Council gave us was not a new liturgy. It gave us a document calling for the reform that had principles or ideas about what should be done. So one of the biggest misconceptions I hear from people is that the Second Vatican Council gave us the new Mass. That's not actually what happened. It gave us a document calling for the reform of the liturgy, and there was this intervening process that gave us the new Mass. Um, of course, including this is the revision of the rites. So, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to change in the Mass? And then, of course, if you make a bunch of changes of the Mass, you've got to have new books that the celebrants used uh, for the Mass. So producing the new rite books uh, as part of part of this process. Um, Pope Paul VI also wasted no time, though. He wanted to implement some of the reforms that he felt he could do effective now. Um, so again, effective February 16th, 1964, so less than a month um, after the document here was promulgated, um, 
He called for seminaries to implement liturgical courses effective that next school year. So one of the things Sacrocentric Pachillion focused on was that we need to actually train our priests in the liturgy. Um, it, it, which seems kind of weird, but remember, again, priests prior to the Second Vatican Council didn't always view their primary role and didn't always connect all their ministerial duties to the celebration of the liturgy. It was kind of like something they did, but it wasn't necessarily the primary focus. Uh, and so like, no, no, that is the source and summit of our faith. So our seminaries need to teach the priests everything they need to know about liturgy. And we need to make sure that the seminaries actually have qualified liturgical courses and liturgical education. Um, again, dioceses should implement uh, commissions to promulgate, or sorry, promote liturgical education. So again, we, we see this call for active participation of the faithful in the liturgy. We need people to actually understand and know what the liturgy is. So the Pope was calling for all of the dioceses across the world to, to put commissions together to figure out how are we actually going to educate the faithful on the Mass so they understand the, the Mass. And then um, two additional commissions. He wants dioceses to form one to study sacred music and one to study sacred art. Um, homilies. So prior to this, the homily was viewed as extra mass. And in fact, it was very common practice, again, for a priest to take off his chasuble before he said a homily at the mass. Um, the, the Vatican Council said, no, the homily is integral to the mass. And so, again, the Pope was saying, okay, homilies are going to be required on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. It's a requirement. You can't skip it. You can't not do it. You have to actually uh, have that. A confirmation should be done during a Mass. So again, prior to this confirmation, could be done outside the Mass. He's like, nope, confirmation should be done as part of the Mass. And the same thing with matrimony. So it was very common prior to the Second Vatican Council for the marriage not to necessarily be celebrated within the confines of a Mass. And you can still do that today, especially when you have like an interfaith marriage. Um, but again, if you've got two Catholics being married, that marriage should occur within the confines of a Mass. Um, and this is a, something that we're going to see over and over and over uh, in the documents um, coming out of the Vatican uh, after the Second Vatican Council. This reminder um, that the regulation of the liturgy um, belongs to the apostolic see and the bishops. Um, so the Pope was cleanly aware, and I don't know if he already got wind of it within the first 30 days, that people were going to try to be a little crazy and start doing things after the council. So right away he said, no, no, you can't do that. Like this, this change needs to be controlled by the apostolic see and the bishops. Um, so no one else can add or subtract anything from the liturgy. So people can't just go out and start doing stuff, um, which sadly happened. Um, people would read the document like, oh, it called for us to do this, so I'm just going to do this. No, no. The Pope is saying, you can't do that. you got to follow the stuff coming out of the Vatican. So he was cleanly, keenly aware that that was going to happen and, and did try to uh, um, stop it the best he could. Okay, any questions on that? Just the immediate chunk that Pope Paul VI did right away. All right, so now we're going to come to the formation of the commission. Um, so again, the commission was the body that the Pope put together to actually go through the process of taking that document from the Vatican Council, those recommendations, and figuring out how we actually implement them. It was composed of bishops from various parts of the world, a few of the cardinals from the Curia, from the Roman uh, office, uh, many of the members who worked on the preparatory committee, so that was a group that prior to the Vatican Council, got together and drafted um, schemas or basically working documents. So when you go to the council, you've got something to start with. You're not just like, hey, here's a blank piece of paper. Start writing down ideas. So, so there were these, these um, preparatory documents that are put together prior to the council for them to work on. It's so like a working draft uh, document. Um, so the folks who worked on that, the folks who were actually part of the conciliar liturgical committee, so the ones who actually met and worked on the document at the council, uh, they were part of that. One of the things that um, I think is important to note is that the, um, the consultors were largely European. So, so the experts who were there kind of you know, providing input and, and thoughts and ideas were largely from, from Europe. Um, and, and that was kind of where the hub of liturgical reform was happening. It was in Europe, um, so in Germany, uh, in Austria, um, 
Norway kind of area. So, so that group that had been working on liturgical reform for the, the, the you know, years prior to this kind of met the bulk of the, of the advisors as part of this. The original president of the commission uh, was Cardinal um, Giacomo Lucaro, Archbishop of Bologna, and then he was later replaced. But the guy that always gets all of the uh, either credit and or arrows shot um, at him all uh, is Annabali Bugnini, who was the secretary of the preparatory commission. Um, he was really instrumental in the reform of the liturgy that happened. He was really instrumental in all the work that happened prior to the Vatican Council and the Council itself. Um, so his his um, yeah his thoughts and work are, are are you know very well represented in all of this stuff. Um, and so he gets a lot of um, either praise and or criticism tossed his way, depending upon how you review the reform of the liturgy. Uh, one of the things I did. Um, oh, sorry. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so over a series of seven years, they really issue three major sets of instructions, which we'll kind of go over through the course of all this stuff. Um, there's a bunch of little other notes and like press conferences, things like that they did, but really three major documents that they would put out um, besides the revised right books that kind of guided everything. Okay. Right. So one of the things that is often talked about uh, Bugnini is that he was a Freemason. That is a charge that gets tossed at him all of the time. Um, and I, I say traditionalist because, you know, there's not really a great way to describe that. But there, there's a group of people out there who, um, you know, flat out reject the, the new mass. Um, and they, they are pretty vocal in, in charging that he was a Freemason. Um, any of that charge against him stems from, at best, uh, speculative information. So there is no hard source that says he was a Freemason. So there's not like a, a registry. There's nobody who was like at his, I don't know what they would even call it, like, you know, initiation or whatever into the Masonic Lodge. Like there's no firsthand evidence. It's people who said stuff that then gets written down and reported. But there is no hard evidence. So, so you know, if you think about this in terms of a court case, the judge would toss it out as circumstantial evidence. There's nothing hard, hard towards that. So again, that's not to say that he couldn't have been, but the evidence does not lead to the conclusion that he was a Freemason. And again, you look at you start to, to, to dissect the people who, who claim that charge against them, and you look at like their supposed sources, they're all second or third hand accounts. Um, and even if he was, um, to suggest that that alone would cause the whole new mass to be invalid, I think is a, a leap too far. Because, uh, again, the, the, the council fathers, including Archbishop Lefebvre, voted in favor of the reforms. And, again, while he was the secretary and had a lot of influence, he wasn't the lone person doing all of the stuff. All right, so the first document they released uh, is Inner Acumenici. Um, and this kind of kicks everything off and... Um, some could argue that they, may sh they maybe should have stopped with this document, and we'll kind of get into that here as we go through it. So this was uh, issued in September 26, 1964. So still less than a year after the document was published by the Vatican Council, they're already trying to uh, implement uh, the reforms that were called for. Um, and really this document has, has three goals. Um, Define the function of bishops, conferences, and liturgical matters. So, again, throughout the document from the Vatican Council, it calls about, we've got to have conferences of the bishop, bishops' conferences, bishop conferences. But it doesn't really say what heck that means. Like, what are they supposed to do? What's their job? What's their function all this? So they try to kind of begin to flush that out in this document. Uh, expand upon the liturgical principles. So, again, the, the document from the Vatican Council has a lot of, you know, ideas, but... How do you get ideas into something concrete that you could actually begin to implement and have it affect the liturgy? And then implement measures from Sacrosanctum Concilium that are not dependent upon revised rite books. So what changes can we make in the Mass that further the goals of the Council, but don't actually require us to have the new books ready to go and produced and in the hands of the priests? 
So they're trying to figure out again, how do we begin to, to, to step some of this stuff in and, and start making some of these changes? So, so this is why if you talk to somebody who may have been um, you know, alive after the Second Vatican Council and can remember you know, the change of the liturgy and all that stuff, you know, why they can say, well, I kind of remember right out way there were things that started to change. Um, it's because, again, there was work being done and there were changes being issued from the, from the Vatican. Uh, again, for what? Again, less than a year after, after the document was published. Um, and again, one of the things they actually do note is that the faithful will more readily respond to the overall reform of the liturgy if this uh, proceeds step by step in stages. Uh, and then if the pastors present and explain it to them by means of the needed catechesis. So um, one of the things you'll often hear, and um, you know, I think even Cardinal Ratzinger will, will lament this, is that oh, we had this, this big rip of a band-aid in like 1970. Well, to some degree that's true, but in another sense, there were changes that were supposed to be stepped in along the way. Um, whether or not all the bishops got those changes out to their priests and implemented correctly is another thing you can debate. Uh, whether or not that needed catechesis of the faithful actually occurred, that can be debatable. But the Vatican did want to see, again, these things stepped in, people educated about why these things were being done and what it means uh, along the way. Um, and again, it, they also note this, this theme that was, was very much in the document, um, the close living union between liturgy, catechesis, religious formation, and preaching. So again, um, just this connectedness of the Mass to everything else that's going on. Um, you know, the Mass should be the greatest catechetical tool that the, the Church has, has. So when somebody who's uncatechized, who's never really been part of the Church, goes to Mass, it should be something that lifts them up and teaches them about the faith. Um, that, that's important. Um, and then again, the connection between liturgy and religious formation. Um, make sure that priests are formed correctly, and then the importance of preaching in the Mass. Oh, that's a duplicate. Okay. All right, so um, one of the things, again, it talks, talks about is the formation of clerics. Um, so again, Pope Paul VI said, hey, we've got to make sure this is in place. Let's get that going. Um, they want all the seminaries to have a chair of liturgy as part of the seminary. So again, somebody who's actually heading up the liturgical formation of our seminarians. And I found this kind of comical, but uh, professors should be trained. Seems to us kind of evident that if you're going to teach something, you should be trained in that. But again, this was a problem that we had in the church. Um, we didn't have necessarily the, the formation in... Um, liturgy that needed to be there so that our professors could actually teach seminarians uh, well. We did great with some mis uh, systematic theology, so they could teach about Aquinas all day long, um, but teaching liturgy wasn't always, always there. Uh, and then existing priests, um, they should also receive instructions. Um, so making sure that our existing priests are out of seminary, okay, we realize that perhaps maybe we've got a deficit in the education you received. Let's go back and re-educate you on the liturgy and everything that needs to be, uh, be taught. Uh, and again, kind of carrying to that theme from, from uh, Pope Paul VI, liturgical celebration shall be carried out as perfectly as possible. So again, second document we're looking at, they're still pointing out, you got to do the stuff that you're supposed to do correctly and don't mess with it. So again, you should carry out the liturgy as perfectly as possible. Follow the manual. Okay, so, um, and just as a side note, these little uh, numbers there. Um, this document and Pope Paul's document, um, they do a great job of trying to call out and connect the dots between what they're saying and where it came from the Vatican Council's uh, decree. So that's what those numbers mean. So formation of the faithful, which was uh, paragraph 19 of the document. A uh, pastor shall strive to carry out the mandate to educate the faithful. So again, pastors, you have a duty to educate the people on the Mass. So you need to carry that out. All right, parts taken by individuals in the liturgy. Excuse me. Parts belonging to the choir or to the people and sung or recited by them are not to be said privately by the celebrant. So prior to the changes in the reforms of the liturgy, what you will see is that, um, for example, the Gloria, you could have the choir. Um, singing the Gloria, you could have the people maybe 
trying to follow along or kind of do it the different. And the priest is up there like that, saying the glory. So all three people are saying the glory all differently, not together. Um, one of the things that the reform talks about is no, that needs to be done in, in uh, communion with one another. So again, the parts that are proper to the people or sung by the, the um, choir um, shouldn't be said, said privately by the priest. The priest should join in actually with the people. And again, readings read or sung by the appropriate ministers are not to be said privately by the celebrant as well. So um, again, that whole idea that this is, this is the, the faithful and the celebrant together offering the mass, not the celebrant doing one thing, the people doing something else, the choir doing something else. Again, we're all working together. You're saying, what does the of the mass? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's still done. So if you, if you follow the, the 62 rubric, it's still done that way. So, yep. Yep. All right, simplification of certain rights. So that was called for in paragraph 34. Um, again, they want to work to achieve that noble simplicity, uh, more attuned to the spirit of the times, which is what the document called for. Um, so they begin to do some certain things here, like uh, the celebrant and minister shall bow to the choir um, only at the beginning and end of service. And um, I should note here, so you'll hear the word choir used interchangeably. Um, in the context of a mass, you have the, con the, the concept of a priest sitting in choir. That doesn't mean the priest is up there in the choir singing. It means the priest is down in the sanctuary by the altar, but he's not concelebrating the mass. So, so you'll often see a priest who will just sit in choir. So, so if you had a priest sitting in choir at the mass, uh, the celebrant prior there would, would um, bow to them quite a bit. It's like, no, no, begin and end the service. That's it. That's all you got to do. Uh, insensation of clergy apart from bishops shall take place on each side of the altar. So, um, if you know, like if you go to the 930 Mass at St. Peter, um, during the offertory, when the gifts are brought up, we incense the altar, and then the deacon will incense the presider. Um, if you had other priests there as well, they would also be incensed before the, the congregation's incensed. Well, previously, if you had, you know, four priests on one side, four priests on the other side in choir, you'd go around and do each one of the priests individually. Like, nope, just go to each side, you know, once down the middle, kind of treat them as a group, and go to the other side. The only exception is bishops. Bishops still get uh, incensed individually. So we can just try to simplify that, that part of it. Um, kissing of the hand and of objects presented or received shall be omitted. So again, uh, it, was, it was customary to, to kiss the hand of the presider when you're handing to something, uh, kiss the chalice when you're taking it back, things like that. Again, that's going to be admitted uh, from, the, from the celebration. Okay, so uh, on to the actual kind of uh, mystery of the Eucharist, as they call it, or the actual um, order of the Mass. Uh, the celebrant is not to say privately the parts sung or recited by the choir or congregation. So again, kind of what we touched on earlier. Um, but he may sing or say those parts with them. So he doesn't have to, but he should, you know, say them with him. But not to do them by himself. He's not to do his own thing. So if they're doing some um, complex glory in the choir, the priest shouldn't be down there just saying it by himself quietly. He should be if he's going to say it, he should be saying the same thing the choir and the congregation are doing. Um, so now we get into some of the things that, that um, I'll, I'll borrow from uh, Pope Francis in one of his recent comments. Um, this, is, this is my opinion, not official church uh, uh, teaching. Um, in the prayers at the foot of the altar, Psalm 42 is, is admitted. Um, it's hard to, to draw a connection from the document to see where they came up with the idea that that should be stripped out. Um, and I think that was an oversight, in my opinion. Um, Psalm 42 is beautiful. Um, you know, I can't, I should, I was going to bring my Bible with me and have the, the actual psalm to recite to you guys. But it's, you know, where I, I go before the, the foot of the altar, uh, the altar of my God, something like that. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. But it's a beautiful psalm. Um, don't know why they admitted that one, to be honest with you. Uh, in the solemn mass, the subdeacon does not hold the patent. So if you remember when we kind of reviewed the 62 liturgy, um, the subdeacon would take the patent and then he would, um, you know, with the humeral veil on, he'd have the, the, the patent, and then he would go down and kind of stand behind the deacon at the bottom of the, the steps and have that up blocking his, his view. Uh, and again, there were some reasons why that existed. That was, that was removed. 
Uh, during the doxology, um, so that's the very end of the Eucharistic prayer, you know, through him, with him, and in him, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, um, the uh, celebrant will elevate the chalice with the host, uh, omitting the signs of the cross. So there were lots of extra signs of the cross that the celebrant would do at that moment in the uh, um, pre-conciliar uh, mass. Uh, those, those are admitted. And then Lord's Prayer, um, during a recited Mass, the congregation may say uh, in the vernacular along with the celebrant. So again, we see the, the use of the vernacular being introduced here. Um, for a sung Mass, the congregation may sing it in Latin along with the celebrant. Distribution of Communion. So um, this is another one where, again, in my opinion, I don't necessarily see where this, this particular change came from. I see, see the idea of simplicity, but right now when you receive communion at a, a um, Novus Ordo Parish, uh, we're going to say here Corpus Christi or the Body of Christ. Um, the previous um, um, rite, the, the words that would be said, we said again and said in Latin is, May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve your soul unto life everlasting. Uh, I find that richer myself, that whole phrase. Uh, and then there'd be a little cross made with the host um, uh, over the communicant, why he was saying that. That was omitted as well. So again, it's just a simple Corpus Christi. There you go. Uh, okay, so this is another section where, uh, again, um, they're going for the simplicity, but again, I'll give my opinion. I, I don't necessarily, um, and, and I guess maybe I'll take a step back. The church, so, so in no way should any of the, you know, in my opinion, they should change this or shouldn't have done this, should be construed as that, that the, the new mass is not a completely 100% valid mass that's beneficial for the faithful. So, um, so the, the, the um, church is 100% within her right uh, as the church to change the liturgy in the way that she sees fit for the faithful in the times. Um, and I think anybody who tries to make the argument that the church doesn't have the right to change the liturgy um, is not a convincing argument. Um, but keep in mind that when we think about the Mass, you've got two concepts. You've got the Mass is, is valid and the Mass is licit. The only thing that's needed for the Mass to be valid is bread and wine with the correct words said by the priest and his intention of turning that into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So when you think about the Mass, you know, 60 minutes or so at St. Peter, Jesus gave us two minutes of the Mass, basically. The other 58 minutes or so of the Mass is what the church has, has decided is beneficial for the faithful to encompass and surround that piece of the Mass that was actually instituted by Christ. So, so I guess what that means is that that's what we call discipline. So the things that we do, the practices that we do, that's not doctrine that was handed on to us by Christ. So Christ didn't say that, okay, you must um, have the chairs over to the right side of the, the uh, altar and the reader must read from over here. I mean, that, none of that stuff is obviously in, in the scripture. Um, so those disciplines can change over time and... Um, the faithful can have conversations again as, as long as the clergy like, well, you know, this is what the, the church is telling us to do. I'm going to do it. It's good. It's valid. But that doesn't mean you can't sit there and, you know, talk about, well, maybe that wasn't the greatest idea. Maybe that was a good idea. You know, so that's what I'm trying to say, I guess, and all that. So what happened here uh, in, in the document is they, they admitted some of the things that were at the very end of the mass. Um, the last gospel. So prior to the changes of the uh, council, um, there was a final gospel read at the end of every Mass, and that was the prologue of John's Gospel. So every Mass ended with the prologue from John's Gospel. Um, and then they suspended what are called the Leonine Prayers. These are prayers that were added by Pope Leo XIII in 1884. Um, it was three Ave Marias, or you know, three Hail Marys, a Salve Regina, uh, a versicle in response, which is the priest has something, the, the, the congregation responds back. A prayer for the conversion of sinners and the St. Michael prayer. Um, was that the shorter version of the St. Michael prayer or the longer one? The longer one. So, again, this is one of those sections that, in my opinion, I wish we would have kept this stuff. Um, and, in fact, if you talk to some more traditionally minded exorcists, they actually think that this has done uh, harm in the spiritual realm by not having this stuff as part of the Mass. Um, because, again, uh, you look at the prologue of John's Gospel and the beauty that was there, and then these, these Leonine prayers. Um, just think about how many times a day the church as a whole would be saying these prayers and imploring, again, for, for, for you know, God. Um, so, so, again, 
One of those things that, again, you, you, can, you can put it under the, the umbrella of the noble simplicity. Maybe that's why they decided that these things should come out, but um, I would have liked to have seen those kept in. Okay, readings and chants. So masses with the congregation, uh, the lesson are the Old Testament readings. So in the case of when there was the vigil and there was Old Testament reading, uh, the epistle. Um, That's supposed to be gospel, not sanctuary. I don't know why sanctuary is in there. Sorry. The lesson, the epistle, and the gospel are to be said facing the people. Um, I don't know why sanctuary ended up in there. So, um, so again, in the 62 Mass, the epistle was usually read uh, facing the altar on the epistle side or the right side of the altar. The gospel was always said facing liturgical north. So, again, the altar is liturgical east. So, liturgical north would be that direction. And again, it was represented, representative of the barbarians coming in from the north. And again, the um, passage from Jeremiah, I think, where it says... Um, the enemy will come from the north. Um, so the gospel being brought to them in the north. Um, but that, that's all changed. So they want that to be said um, facing the people. Uh, either at the lectern or the edge of the sanctuary in a solemn mass. Uh, in a sung mass, if the readers uh, if the readings are in the vernacular, they may be read. So if you go to a, a solemn high mass, the epistle and the gospel will be chanted. Um, and again, they're saying, no, if we actually are doing those in the vernacular, then you can just read them. You don't have to chant them. So again, we see the vernacular here in the readings. Uh, homily, again, Sundays and holy days must have a homily. Um, and then days where there's a large number of um, people at present, a homily is recommended. I just have one quick question about the previous slide. Yep. Um, for the gospel, yes. it says that it be said in the vernacular. Yes. So that doesn't preclude it being chanted, right? Nope, it does not. Nope. Um, so this is one of these very interesting things. So, um, again, the homily is part of the liturgy for the day. So any syllabus proposed must be, must keep in mind the liturgical uh, calendar. So what was very common, um, prior to the council was that bishops would give their priests, uh, basically a preaching schedule, a syllabus. So I want you guys to preach on these topics over the next, you know, 20, 20 weeks. Um, all of those topics had absolutely nothing to do with, with the liturgical season, with the gospel that's going to be read, the epistle that's going to be read, they were just topics that they wanted them to preach on. Um, so again, that aids to that whole concept of the, the homily not really being part of the Mass, because they're just off there talking about something that really has nothing to do with the time of year, nothing to do with the readings. Um, so they're saying, no, no, the homily is part of the liturgy for the day. So again, if you're going to produce a syllabus and say, you, you guys should be preaching these topics, make sure they line up with the readings so that you, they actually make sense and you're breaking open the readings that, that are being proclaimed that day. Uh, prayers of the faithful. Um, so again, that idea of bringing those back in, local bishops may mandate its use, um, and then takes place before the offertory. So the prayers of the faithful should be brought into the, back into the Mass. The bishops can say, you guys have to do these, um, and done before the offertory. And then use of the vernacular. Um, so we've kind of talked about that a couple of times, but... Uh, approval from competent ecclesiastical authority and with approval from the Holy See. So again, if your bishop's conference says, hey, you can do it, and the Holy See says you can do it, vernacular can be used. Uh, again, the things that they called out, um, and it, okay, so, yeah, I'll just go through this and I'll make comment on it. So lessons, epistles, gospels, prayers of the faithful. So the readings, prayers of the faithful can be done in the, the vernacular. Um, the chants, uh, so the Kyrie, the Gloria, the Creed, the Sanctus, the Anus Dei, the introit or the um, uh, entrance antiphon, the offertory and communion antiphons, chance between readings, all that can be done in the vernacular. Uh, acclamations, greetings, dialogue formulation, formularies, Lord's Prayer can be done in the vernacular. Um, but if you publish a missile, it's got to have both the Latin and English test, text. So pretty much right here, they're saying the only thing that really can't be said in the vernacular at this point in time is the canon or the Eucharistic prayer that's part of Mass. Um, this again, to me, is one of the areas where perhaps I would, I could argue they maybe overstepped. Because if you look at the documents of the Vatican Council, it said Latin is to be retained. Um, they've pretty much at this point almost like said, you can pretty much get rid of it altogether, uh, with, you know, one little exception being the, the, the canon at this point. So, so I would argue that like some of these things that don't change. So, you know, the Gloria, the Creed, the Sanctus, the Anus Dei, the things that are, are, are the same math after mass are things where we probably should keep Latin uh, and use Latin still for those those parts. And then again, the readings being in, in um, 
the vernacular makes complete sense to me because, again, if you go to most uh, parishes that do the extraordinary form, they'll come down and say the readings in English before they preach um, because most, a lot of people don't understand Latin readings that they uh, proclaim for the day. Uh, and then there's some of the prayers that change, so like the, um, the colic, the prayer after communion, those kinds of prayers that are different every time. Perhaps, you know, those being the vernacular makes sense because, again, you know, they're, they're intelligible. Church design. Um, again, encouraging active participation by the faithful. Uh, the main altar uh, would preferably be freestanding, walking around it, and celebrating facing the people. Um, so again, we see that uh, concept of the freestanding altar being introduced in this document um, and the idea of being able to face, uh, say mass facing the people. A celebrant chair visible to the faithful. So you should be able to see where the celebrant's at and, um, you know, again, he should be able to have, you know, line of sight to him. Minor altars. So again, if you look at St. Peter, um, we've obviously got our main high altar, but on the two sides, the Mary side and the, the um, uh, Joseph side, there are those side altars. And then most old churches have those. Um, they're saying, no, there should be fewer of those in churches. And really, if you're going to have extra altars, they really should be in their own kind of separate chapels and not part of the main church. Uh, and again, that's to go back to that, that I don't say phenomenon, which you'd see. Uh, and you'd see it a lot, especially when you went to St. John's uh, on Creighton's campus, where you'd have, you know, five or six different masses going on in the church all at the same time because there'd be different priests at all these different altars doing their, their mass. And, you know, if you were the faithful, you're like, I, I just want to do this guy over here, you know? I mean, it, it's, it, you're not really sure. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't lend itself to the active participation of the faithful when you've got basically, in essence, five different masses going on at one time within the same, you know, four walls. Uh, reservation of the Eucharist. So a solid tabernacle placed in the middle of the main altar, uh, a minor altar worthy, uh, a minor worthy altar, sorry, or in another properly adorned part of the church. So, so we're seeing here in this document the, the uh, permission to, again, move the uh, tabernacle um, outside of the, the main center altar and off to the side or potentially in a different spot within the church. Again, it's properly or, or adorned. All right, so a lot of stuff there. Um, you know, I think as you go through this, and I would argue that it's, to, to me, you, you, there's certain things you can, I think, pretty clearly trace back to the document from Vatican II. Um, I think there's probably some things that you can make a reason argument for where maybe it's a, maybe it's a stretch too far um, or not. I mean, I, you can see it either way. Um, but again, I think you can see, at least at this point in time, um, a pretty good connection between most of this stuff and, and, and the, the documents coming out of the, the Second Vatican Council. The, the moving of the tabernacle, would that from the documents? Um, no, no. It does not, it was not explicitly laid out in the document that the tabernacle could, should be moved out. So, yeah. All right, so this was done in 1964. Um, in 1965, we did have a uh, revised missile that was put out. Um, that basically took this stuff that we just talked about and put it into the missile. So these are the changes that you can make to the mass with, I lack of a better term, without a lot of work. So we're not changing the words of any of the prayers, the text of any of the stuff that the priest said. None of that was being touched at this point in time. These were just more about actions and gestures and movements and stuff within the, the, the mass. Um, and so you could, you could relatively... Uh, easy, for lack of a term, revise a missile. So there was a missile put out in 1965 that um, there's not a lot of copies of it that exist. It, it didn't get printed in great great quantity. Um, a lot of priests actually just took that document and took their old missile and went through with like a, a felt-tip pen and just kind of made changes into it to basically save themselves from having to buy a new missile because they knew another one was going to come out in a few years and these things aren't exactly cheap. So so this there's not a ton of copies of this thing. Um, so, but in 65, a new missile was published, and this sometimes gets called the Mass of Vatican II. And what they mean by that is that a lot of people will argue that this missile and the first set of documents coming out of the, the council really is probably what a lot of the bishops envisioned would change in the Mass. Um, 
you know, I think a lot of the bishops didn't necessarily think that what was done at the end was actually what was going to be done at the end. And so, again, the arguments made that, no, this is probably maybe closer to what, what they, what they rep, you know, would, would see. The, the one exception being the revised lectionary, which was still being worked on. Um, I think most people expected that we would have, you know, again, expanded readings in the Mass, and they were all on board with that. But the actual changes in the way we celebrate the liturgy, this was probably pretty close to what I, a lot of the bishops had expected we would, we would see. And so this has, again, a lot of the stuff we just talked about clearly put out there. Um, so the prayers at the foot of the altar are still there. Psalm 42 is out, but the prayers at the foot of the altar are still in the 65 Missal. Um, the sign of the cross opens Mass. You have the uh, intro and the Kyrie, and again, a song the priest is singing with the people, so just like we expected him to. The collect, vernacular could be used for the collect, so again, that, that was there. Um, liturgy of the Word, so the two readings still remain. Again, the New Dictionary is not ready yet. Vernacular used for the readings, set at the ambo. Uh, homily, there. Uh, creed said with the people, so the priest wasn't saying it by himself. The, creed, pre, the, the priest was leading the people and saying the creed. Uh, so that was in the 65 Missal. Uh, at the Liturgy of the Eucharist, the traditional offertory prayers are still retained and being said. So those get changed later, but the traditional prayers are still said at this point in time. Um, this is all done in Latin. Um, the pray brethren, where, okay, you know, pray brethren that my sacrifice to yours may be acceptable to, to God our Almighty Father. That could be said in the vernacular. Makes sense because again the congregation is joining in with the priest to pray together that the sacrifice can be um, said, and then the priest can say the prefers in the vernacular as well. So that's part of the the mass, the, the, the Eucharistic prayer that changes every mass. So the, this preface, so they could say that in the in the vernacular. Um, the sanctus could be said in the vernacular in the sixty five missal. Uh, didn't have to be. Um, the canon is only said in Latin with most of the gestures that priests would make in the 62 Missal were still retained. So a lot of the signs of the cross, the way they had their hands positioned, all that stuff was still retained in the 65 Missal, um, with the exception of a few of the signs of the cross um, done at the end of the doxology. Uh, the Our Father, they allowed for the vernacular of the Our Father. Um, they did have a shortened uh, phrase at communion, so just the Corpus Christi was, was in this one. Um, and then the prayer after communion could be said in the vernacular. Again, that changes week to every week, so that, that makes sense. The ite misses, or the dismissal, could be done in the vernacular. Uh, the final blessing could be in the vernacular, and the last gospel was omitted. So we've got this missal in 65 that very closely follows the document that came out of the commission in 64. Um, and again, for a lot of people, a lot of people will make the argument that this is likely what a lot of the council fathers maybe envisioned was, was going to be the extent of the reform. So it had been interesting to see what would have happened if um, they would have stopped here. You know, uh, I, I would argue that if, if they would have stopped the reform at this point, um, that we would never have seen Archbishop Lefebvre um, start the SSPX um, and then likely the FSSP and to do Christ's kingdom, that probably would have existed because, uh, again, I think most of the stuff he would have been, been relatively okay with. So, again, not a very common missile that got printed a lot. There's not a ton of copies out there. Um, they're hard to get a hold of because, uh, again, most priests just kind of did the stuff on their own with their, their old missile because you could. But it implemented most of what that, that document said. So we're about halfway through the 60s. We've kind of got, the, again, the document out of the council. We've got the, the first you know, guideline from the commission and this first changed missile being, being published. Any questions on that thus far? Okay. Trace abhink años. So the second document, three years ago. That's what that means. So it's Latin for three years ago. May 4th, 1967. So just a touch under... Three years since Inter Ocumenici was released or promulgated. So they put that out there. Priests began to follow it. They made changes to the missile. They published a missile with those, those ideas represented in the missile, began to use it. Uh, the document opens with, you know, uh, a glowing report of the changes. So, you know, hey, there's been three years since we've done this, and the, the feedback we got from the bishops has been phenomenal. Things are going really well. We've got increased, more aware, and intense participation of the faithful. Um, so, you know, again, um, th that's what we've done thus far has been well received and, and going well. Uh, but the bishops have provided input and other adaptions to the right. So they submitted them to the concilium. 
they were reviewed by the Concilium along with the Congregation of the Rites, and that's the that's the Roman office that actually has the ultimate authority for, for putting this stuff out. Um, those things that can be implemented strictly in the rubrics, so the way we say the Mass, not the actual text of the Mass, but the way we say the Mass, the things we do, can be considered now. Um, but again, we come back to this, this reinforcement that changes by individual priests um, are not permissible. I don't know where the hell which the word came in. Okay, so now we're going to start to see perhaps maybe um, a few more changes um, in the uh, way Mass is said. Um, as a side note, one of the things I find interesting is that, again, so the first document they produced, um, they make a concerted effort in the text to link the stuff they're doing back to um, the document from Vatican Council. Uh, you don't see that in this one at all. There's no references to uh, Sacramento and Concilium explicitly called out in the, the stuff they're, they're talking about here. So we have some changes in the genuflections of the celebrant. So on going to or leaving the altar, if there is a tabernacle, is when they will genuflect, after elevating the host in the chalice, after the doxology, uh, at communion, and after reposing the Blessed Sacrament. So the genuflections have been pared down quite a bit compared to uh, the uh, preconciliar Mass. Uh, kiss in the altar only at the beginning of Mass and the end of Mass. So again, the 62, there's more, op uh, more, more spots where the celebrant will um, uh, reverence the altar. Again, that's been stripped down. Uh, the offertory. Uh, the patent with host and chalice is placed on the corporal. The sign of the cross with the patent and chalice is omitted. So if you go and watch a 62 Mass, um, as the uh, priest takes the, uh, the patent with the um, host, uh, he will say the prayer over that, and then he will make a sign of the cross with the, the patent. I'll do the same thing with the chalice. That's been omitted at this point now in the, in the changes. Um, and then the patent with the host remains on the corporal before and after the consecration. So again, there's no patent going down with the subdeacon like there had been previously. Uh, if the Mass is celebrated with the congregation, uh, the canon may be said out loud. So this is a big change. So again, prior to the, the, the uh, council, the canon was always said quietly by the celebrant, uh, almost inaudible. Um, now um, it's going to be said out loud. In a sung Mass, he may sing those parts that are allowed. So he may sing part of the canon now um, uh, at the Mass. Okay, during the canon, um, during the uh, To You Therefore, Most Merciful Father, that's the very beginning of the Mass, the priest stands with his hands uh, outstretched, which was a change in his, his gestures. Um, only one sign of the cross is made over the offerings. So again, if you watch a 62 Mass or prior, there's lots of signs of the cross made over the, uh, the offerings. Lots of signs of the cross. Um, we're down now just to one when it says, and bless these gifts. And you'll see, and bless, and then the father, the priest will make the, the sign of the cross over the gifts. We're down to just one sign of the cross over the gifts. So kind of going back to that whole idea of noble simplicity and reducing excessive repetitions. Um, after the consecration, the celebrant is no longer required to join their thumb and forefingers together. So if you look at, again, at a 62 and prior, and the priests who celebrate those, after they have touched the host of the consecration, they will keep these fingers together like this for the remainder of the Mass until they actually have them uh, purified after distribution of communion. They'll remain together. Um, and that, it was such an important deal that um, St. Isaac Jogues, who uh, was a missionary to the uh, Iroquois nation uh, in America, um, was captured and had his fingers cut off by the, the uh, Native Americans. Because they, they watched the priest and they knew that that was important to them. So they could recognize the gesture. So they, got, they cut his fingers off. Um, and um, he actually had to get a dispensation from Rome to be able to celebrate the Mass without those fingers because, again, that was such an important thing uh, to, the, to the priests. Um, but again, they, they've taken that out at this point in time. Uh, they say any particle that remains, the priest can basically rub their fingers together over the patent to, to remove those particles. And then the vestments, the maniple, is no longer required. So that's the piece of fabric that the priest would have on his so left arm? Um, so it's a little piece of fabric that kind of comes down like there. Um, that traditionally was, was they, they think, brought in because it was you know, kind of used for the priest to be able to wipe himself off of if he needed to. 
Um, and then just kind of remain with there, but that can now be removed from the vestments. Um, so again, Pope Francis says my, my little sidebar. This is one of the changes that I know that they made here that um, I wish they didn't make personally. Um, and the reason why I say that is because, again, to me there is a, a beauty in the presider recognizing that he just touched God and keeping his fingers together until his fingers have been purified over the chalice after he's distributed communion. Um, and, and the message or the meaning that's conveyed to the, the, the faithful by him doing that, I think was beautiful. And I, that, I, to me, that's sad that, that that is not only required. You do, you do. Some priests will still do that. Hmm? Father Carl does it. Yeah. Yeah, Father Patrick Stack, if you've ever seen him, he'll, he's very, very big on that, too. So, Father Barman does a really good job of trying to keep them together, too, most of the time. So, um, so again, just a few more things they've changed here. Um, but again, I, like I said before, church is completely within its right um, <coughs> to change these things, these disciplines in the Mass. I mean, again, yeah, that's, that's, that's the church's right and prerogative. None of this will invalidate the mass or say that the mass is the, the new mass is not good uh, or or valid or any of that stuff. Um, but again I, I would say that you could begin to start to, to look at this stuff and go, okay, did this stray too far from the council or not? I think you could you can you can have that conversation um, as you as you look at some of the stuff. All right. Uh, the next document that comes out um, is the Eucharistic Mystery, promulgated May 25th, 1967, by the Sacred Congregation on Rites. So one of the uh, documents we'll look at that wasn't published by the Concilium directly or by Pope Paul VI. Um, so there's a few things on here that I think were, were uh, again, important here. Stress the Mass is both sacrifice and meal. So, um, I think one of the things that you can, you can maybe say was um, done at Trent and kind of carry through those, those, those years you know, after Trent. Uh, and again, understandably why. You had a bunch of Protestants who were denying that the, the uh, Mass was a sacrifice. And so the church, again, in, in its wisdom, said, no, the Mass is a sacrifice. Um, we maybe went too far to that side and forgot that it's also a sacrifice, but it's also a meal at the same time. Um, and so they were trying to stress here, like, no, the Mass is both sacrifice and meal. Um, and then stress the importance um, that the Mass is the celebration of the church. It's never merely a private act. So this idea that um, that you know a priest says mass and it's a private event, um, even if he's only, then there's no congregation. Well, it's no, it's still the prayer of the church. He's praying on the behalf of the church. It's not just his mass; it's the church praying. Um, the faithful participate most fully not only when they offer the sacrifice, uh, sorry, the sacred victim in, in themselves, but also when they receive the same victim. So again. It's a sacrifice where we offer the victim and ourselves, but it's also a meal in which we receive that victim. So if you recall in our conversation about the 62 and prior, one of the, um, I would say, abuses that maybe occurred at that point in time was that there was a disconnect maybe between the mass that was being said and the reception of communion by the faithful. So people didn't receive communion all the time, and or you could have another priest grabbing the host out of the tabernacle and distributing communion in the middle of the mass before the sacrifice that was occurring was even done. Um, so, so they're saying, nope, nope, um, for the, the faithful to most fully participate, they offer, so active participation uh, in the Mass, and they also receive from that same Mass. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the church would say, ideally, if you could do it, um, you would consecrate the host that you need for the people who are there, so you're receiving from that actual sacrifice. Uh, practically speaking, we can't do that, so there's always some host in the tabernacle, so maybe that host that you received was technically consecrated in a previous Mass. You know, you know it's kind of hard to say. Um, but in the perfect world, you'd always receive sacrifice from that actual Mass uh, that you were at. 
Uh, it dives into the Eucharistic catechesis that was called for. Uh, again, helping the faithful to realize uh, this is the center of the Christian life. Um, so one of the, the, the phrases you'll hear um, coming out of the Vatican Council, and you'll see in the catechism, was the Mass is, you know, the source and some of, some of our faith. Um, and again, we'll make a general statement again, it doesn't apply to everybody, but, you know, that, that kind of language and that kind of thought wasn't necessarily always there in the pre-conciliar church, that, you know, the, the Mass is everything. It's like, like that the, that's the highest thing you will do that week in your life is going to Mass. And that everything in your life should be to, to lead towards a Mass, and then everything from your life should flow out of the Mass. So again, making sure the faithful realize that. Um, to do that, they want to avoid having two liturgical celebrations in the same church at the same time. Um, so again, that, that idea that, no, you, you can't have multiple Masses going on Full active participation of the faithful is representation of the unity of the church. So it's not just, you know, um, because it's confusing, because it's, you know, uh, distractions. Because, no, no, we're, we're, a un we're, we're a body of Christ. We're all united in the body of Christ. And so in order to, to represent that unity, we all need to be actively participating in the one liturgical celebration, the one Mass that's going on at that moment in time. Not a whole bunch of different Masses going on in the same space. Um, so this I found uh, interesting because this is something you often hear, hear mentioned. Um, and remodeling of churches, care should be taken to avoid the destruction of sacred art. Totally missed that one. Like the church totally missed that one, sadly. There were a lot of churches that were, were renovated and a lot of sacred art and beautiful altars and stained glass and everything else that was just ripped out and destroyed. So uh, the church did not call for that. The Vatican did not call for churches to be vandalized and destroyed and all that stuff. Care should be taken to preserve that and avoid the destruction of sacred art. Um, sadly, that didn't always happen. All right, any questions on that? Okay, so now we're getting to um, kind of the end of the uh, chain. Uh, Missale Romanum. This was the document um, published by Pope Paul VI. Um, it's an apostolic constitution published April 3rd, 1969. This serves as Pope Paul's comments on the new mass. So the council has issued these two documents. We've had one kind of revised missal, but everything has been focused on um, the actions and the gestures of the priest. Um, the parts of the mass that can be said in vernacular, the location of the priest in the in the the space, the location of the the, the reader in the space, maybe some of the roles of the subdeacon, things like that. Um, thus far, other than omitting the last gospel, omitting the Leonine prayers, and um, omitting Psalm forty-two, there have been no changes in the texts, the prayers, the words that are said. Um, that changes in the new the new missal. So so all this all this um, the rubrics the the how we do things were changing. The what was said was being worked on, and it's this document where the Pope was promulgating the new missal that's going to have all of the new prayers and everything else. Um, so Pope Paul VI makes an attempt in this document to set this liturgical reform in the larger historical context. Um, so he starts with Trent, and he starts with Pope Pius's, uh, post, <coughs> Pope Pius V's Quo Primum. Now, interestingly enough, Quo Primum is a, a papal bull that some folks will try to argue says that the church can never change the Mass after the Council of Trent. Uh, even though the church changed the Mass after the Council of Trent, uh, even though nowhere in the documents of Vatican II or in the... Um, debate or conversation that occurred at the council? Do you see any uh, bishop reference quote premium saying, hey, wait, we can't have this conversation because we can't change the mass. Um, people nowadays will try to argue that quote premium says we can't change the mass. Um, so that's that's an interpretation of a document that I, I do not reject, or sorry, I do not believe, I completely reject that. Um, the liturgy belongs to the church. The church has the right and the prerogative to change and regulate the liturgy. Um, but he notes that in, in uh, Pope Pius V's time, there was a study of the ancient manuscripts in the Vatican Library. And when they, you know, again, try to, to um, develop and, and um, kind of codify the Mass, they'd say, okay, what's, what's been going on? What have people have been doing? Let's figure out where this needs to be. 
and, and get this get this ironed out so we had one unified mass. And again, you see when Pope uh, Pius V issued that, that this was the one and only Roman rite, the one mass you had to say, unless you could show us that your tradition had been said for at least 200 years prior to today. Nope, you got to get rid of it. You got to go with what we've got. Um, so he's saying, hey, you know, he did that. We're kind of doing the same thing. We're going back and we're looking at the old documents. Oh, no, by the way, there have been 500 years, is that right? Ish, 500 years of archaeology and discovery and research and digging that has happened. We have a lot more material now. So again, we can go back and look at some of the older rites and older ways of saying the liturgy and again, bring that to, into, to bear with what we're doing today in, in, in a certain way. Uh, and then he talks about the, the reforms of Pope Pius XII. Um, so again, Pope Pius XII, prior to the council, um, had issued a, a beautiful encyclical on the Mass, um, Syrian Fide, um, beautiful encyclical, um, but he has changed uh, Holy Week. So he restored the Paschal Vigil. So the Easter Vigil was at noon, he restored it to its proper place in the evening on, on Holy Saturday, changed the Holy Week rite. Um, there were other changes that he supposedly had queued up, the Vatican had queued up, that kind of got put on hold when the council got called. But there were going to be some additional changes coming down to the liturgy. So, so it's not like, again, to the people who would argue that the Mass came out from Trent and then just stayed there static. It did have some changes that were made to it. You could argue how um, massive those changes were, but it wasn't static. And so, we, again, he's just trying to say, hey, you know, the Mass has been moving, and there's been some changes that have happened, and we're, we're flowing along with that. Um, he says that major innovation that you're going to see in the Mass is the Eucharistic prayer. So the first part, the preface, that has always maintained a diverse formulation. So, so there's always a different preface at the Sunday Mass. Uh, they're different for the seasons of the Mass, so for Advent, for Lent, for Easter, uh, for Christmas, for ordinary time. Um, but that part of the Mass, even back you know, prior to the Council, has always changed based on the time of year. The second part, the canon of action, as they call it, or the part, again, where the consecration takes place, uh, that took a fixed formula somewhere in the 4th or 5th century uh, in the uh, Roman Rite. The East... What is it, Easter? Sorry, that should be Eastern. The Eastern liturgies have always allowed various uh, anaphoras or various Eucharistic prayers. So it's only the Roman Rite where we've had this fixed Eucharistic prayer, this one and only one Eucharistic prayer for, for a very long time. The Eastern liturgies have always maintained variability into that part. Um, and so um, one of the things that, that is being called for here is, no, we're going to introduce three new canons or three new Eucharistic prayers that are going to be added. But all of the Eucharistic prayers, so you know, again, there are one through four, all of them have the exact same words of consecration. So again, the part that makes the Mass valid where the priest actually pronounces the words of consecration over the gifts with the intention of turning them into the body and blood of Christ, that's going to be the same regardless of the Eucharistic prayer. We're going to say the same words. <coughs> and all of them will stress different aspects of the, the sacrifice and the, and the mystery of the faith, but again, um, adding variability into that. And he calls that, again, the major innovation in the, in the Novus Ordo. Um, again, he reiterates the call for simplification. Um, preservation of the uh, substance, but um, eliminated our elements that came to be duplicated or added with no uh, advantage. Um, so again, if you go back to the, the mass as they were able to study it, look at it, you know, from, from uh, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, I should say, um, there were some parts that were a lot more simple and streamlined, and over the years, things have been added, and adornments have been added, repetitions have been added, uh, gestures have been added, uh, and again, the document, the Vatican Council called, called for a, a noble simplification of the of the rite. Um, and above all, they want to see this um, this simplification uh, in the rites of the offering of the bread and the wine, and the breaking of the bread, and then the distribution of communion. So, so again, trying to maybe streamline that a little bit or simplify that uh, versus some of the adornments that had been added. Uh, and he reiterates the desire of restoration. So the homily, the prayers of the faithful, the penitential rite. Um, so, so these are parts of the Mass that uh, had been there, had gotten taken out, and they wanted to make sure they were brought back in there. So again, that's, that's what he's saying. Hey, these are the things that we're, we're, we, we've done, we've thought, said were important, that we need to have back in the Mass. Uh, and then the expanded lectionary. So the expanded lectionary is ready. 
Um, so we're going to go to a two-year Sunday cycle. Uh, I got those reversed, sorry. Try that again. A three-year Sunday cycle, a two-year daily cycle, and inclusion of Old Testament readings. So again, the Old Testament readings were not part of the Mass other than the uh, Easter Vigil at this point in time. Um, and then the one exception to that is during um, Easter tide, so right after uh, Easter, instead of the uh, Old Testament reading, we've got a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Um, I would argue, in many ways, to me, this expanded lectionary was the um, high point or high mark or whatever you want to say, the, the, the crown jewel of the reform after the Vatican Council. The, the expanded revised lectionary was so well done and so well put together that a lot of Protestant denominations have adopted it as well um, because it is so beautifully laid out. So, um, and they've done such a great they did such a great job with it. Implemented on November thirtieth, nineteen sixty nine. So again, he uh, publishes in April of that year um, on the first Sunday of Advent of the next new new liturgical year. The new missile will go into effect. All right. Then we come to the final thing that put out was put out by the commission, uh, the document liturgical reforms, which was September fifth, nineteen seventy. So, almost a year after we started using the new missile, they put out their final document uh, from the commission. Uh, the final final main document they did. And it really just serves as a recap of the commission's work. So there's nothing really groundbreaking in here. Um, again, they, they, at this point, are trying to, I think, um, do two things. Point back to the, the Vatican Council and saying, okay, the right should be marked by a noble simplicity. Uh, they should be short, clear, and unencumbered by useless repetitions. They should be with the people's power of within the people's power of comprehension, and as a rule, not require much explanation. Uh, so again, they're trying to say, hey, this document we produced, all these documents we've done, all these changes we've done, this new missile, everything, it all goes back to this. This whole call for a noble simplicity with uh, no useless repetitions in the mass and the ability of the people to comprehend what's going on um, with, without much explanation. Uh, but again, you see, you saw, saw the very first document, you see it at the very end, Quick to remind people again that the mass of the church is right and an individual priest cannot do what he wants. So sadly, at this point in time, you saw priests just going out and doing a whole lot of stuff that wasn't correct. It wasn't within even the reformers of the council or the reformers of the, the church. Um, so the final document they put out, just like the first document they put out, says, hey, remember, you can't just do what you want to do. you got to follow the church's guidelines. Um, the book of sacred scripture possesses the primacy in the liturgy. So, again, the, the focus on the Word of God being so, so important. Uh, God is speaking to His people in the Word. Readings should never be substituted. So this lectionary that they spent all this time working on and putting together, that, again, was so good that Protestants even adopted it. Um, you can't start substituting things and changing. you, you got to use the lectionary we provided. And the homily is to explain Explain the word of God and show its relevance in our times. So again, the homily is not just something extra that you can add or not add. It serves a purpose, which is to break open this word that you've just received, to break open how God is speaking to his people today in this reading uh, for these times. Liturgical texts are to be treated with the highest respect. Uh, congressional singing is to be fostered by every means possible. Um, this is, again, one of the spots where I, I, I think you can make a reasoned argument that, again, there might be a little bit of overstep. New types of music suited to the culture of the people to be included. Um, again, I think the, the Vatican Council was pretty clear that chant was to be given pride of place. Um, this document seems to have opened the door to the uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary uh, music at Mass. Um, so, again, perhaps maybe this is one that you can argue that was an over, overstep. Okay, I think I actually got through most of that. Wow. Um, so one of the things that we didn't touch on um, so in April of 1969 the, the, the Pope Paul um, issued his, his um, document 
promulgating the new mass. Um, at that point in time, they also also try again issued the general instruction of the Roman Missal. So that is the document that contains the rubrics for how the mass is to be said, how all of the liturgical rites are to be carried out. Um, that document um, went out, um, and actually there was a um, um, pretty big reaction to that, that actual document. There were a couple of cardinals. Uh, Ottaviani was one of the the, the one who's who's you know the the I guess we're having this named after who basically said, oh, hold, hold, okay, hold on, hold on. Um, we were cool, we were okay with what you did in '65, but this this missile here seems to have may perhaps maybe gone too far from what we intended from the council, um, and um, so he he actually had published a document. Um, you can actually look at it today. It's called the Ottavani Intervention. I'm um, basically saying, hey, you guys, I think you went too far. Um, interestingly enough. Um, Pope Paul VI actually saw that document as a rebuke of his work and maybe kind of took it a little too personal. But because of who, whose name was on it, uh, Ottaviani was so well respected um, that he said, okay, I can't ignore this uh, and revise the general instruction to kind of correct some of the things that he called out in that document that, that uh, he felt were um, going a little too far. Um, and we can get into that more of that maybe next week when we talk about reactions to to the the new mass and stuff like that. But um, but yeah, there there it wasn't you know again just perfectly smooth sailing uh, over these changes. Um, there was debate in the church, and still is debate today. I mean, um, we we obviously have you know the uh, uh, individuals who are are um, say wed is the right word, but. Um, who prefer the extraordinary form of the Mass. And again, Pope Benedict said, you know, that's a beautiful expression. There's no problem with that. We have, you know, FSSP who's able to offer that here in, in town. Um, but, you know, there's still people out there who will debate, you know, whether or not these changes were good or right or where they should have gone or where they shouldn't have gone. Um, and I think you can make some, some reason arguments on both sides of the equation on that. But again, um, as long as you don't step across that line to say that the Novus Ordo is an invalid, mass that is harmful to the faithful. Because again, the church, uh, two things, the church, well within her right, well within her prerogative to, to regulate the liturgy. Um, and, you know, if we believe that the, the Holy Spirit guards and protects the church, the church is not going to be able to promulgate something that is going to be ultimately harmful to the faithful. Um, so to say that it put out a mass that is, um, you know, leading souls to hell, yeah, that would be against that. So any questions, comments, thoughts, anything I need, didn't clarify? There's a lot of, like I said, with every class we've done thus far, you could spend, you know, years, years going over this stuff. Um, there's a lot more documents out of the Vatican during this whole point in time. I mean, again, I hit on the big major milestones, but all the little press releases, all the little snippets, the interviews, all the stuff that was done through the course of, there's a lot, a lot of material that you can spend hours going through. The one thing they don't do, which is kind of unfortunate, um, they don't keep meeting minutes uh, in these things. Um, so there's no um, there's no record of like any debates that occurred when the when the council and the concilium was meeting, when the commission was meeting. So if they're talking about, well, we should take this out of the master, we should change this. There's none of that stuff was recorded, unfortunately. So you can't look at meeting minutes and see what were the thoughts and what were the conversations that were going on. Um, that'd be kind of nice if those records were available and we could look at that kind of stuff to see, you know, maybe some more of the thoughts that were behind things. Um, but yeah, so any other questions, anything, anybody? Bill, you're always good for one. So my dad was a lifelong Catholic and I can remember when I was starting to consider, um, you know, conversion, we were talking about some things, I was telling you about some services that we could not do and was it adamant that, um, there should be no Latin spoke, spoken in the Mass. And in fact, he was saying that, that I don't know if he was confused thinking that, that we had somehow attended a Latin Mass, because I was trying to tell him, no, I'm for certain that wasn't just a Latin Mass, because I'd actually been yep. to one. And he was adamant that there should not be any Latin spoken. Where, where did that come from? Um, so I think, uh, I think, I think a couple things. So, so A, clearly the uh, Vatican Council did not call for that. So there was no call from the Council 
to eliminate Latin in the Mass at all, uh, and in fact, Latin should be retained, was pretty clearly called for in the Council. Um, there's never really no call in the um, um, documents themselves uh, that came out post-Council to get rid of all Latin. They obviously opened up the use of vernacular quite extensively throughout the Mass. Um, the options were there. Um, One of the things that I think the council was striving for uh, was the um, ability to give the church um, a greater opportunity to, to, for lack of a better term, customize the liturgy into different areas. So you got to think about when, when, when Trent was, was occurred, the primary focus was Europe. Um, travel was really impossible almost at that point in time. You couldn't be a bishop over in South America and easily make it to the council in Trent. That's not an easy tr travel. So you've got a very European focus on liturgy. Um, it's a response to the Protestant Reformation, which was occurring in Europe. Um, and so, so we have this very rigid liturgical formula that was great for that area and that area, and, and did a phenomenal job across the, the, the world. But it, it, to some degree, maybe it, it put put some handcuffs on the, the church's ability to, you know, go into a remote village in Africa that we had never been to and uh, put a liturgy in front of them that actually connected to them in a way that was was edifying and, and, and brought the gospel to them. Um, so, so I think the, the council's goal was to, okay, we still want to have a liturgical formula, we still want to have a rite that has rubrics and rules, but we're going to give some more, more space opened up um, to be able to, you know, again, Adapt the liturgy to the, to the times and to, to the people that we're trying to trying to meet. Um, I think the one thing we often forget about is that all of this stuff was being promulgated in the 1960s when culturally there was upheaval and stuff going on, um, and I think those things collided, and perhaps in an, in a in a in a mistaken. Um, idea of how we become relative in the midst of all that stuff, we went too far with these changes. and said, okay, well, we can use vernacular. People seem like that better, so we're just going to go to everything English because people don't want anything old. It's the, it's the, the, the you know, the, the cultural revolution of the 60s, all the old is bad. We got to reject all that's old. Well, if people said everything in Latin, that's got to be bad. It's got to be, you know, it's old, so we should have everything in the vernacular. So I think it was a collision of, uh, again, this, this, I think, noble goal, which is, okay, we want to recognize that we need to have the ability as we go into some of these other areas and again bring the gospel to to have some flexibility in our formulas so that we can meet the people where they're at. But then you have that collide with the cultural revolution that was going on in the '60s, and that's where you get a lot of this crazy stuff. I have a question to kind of piggyback on that a little bit more local. You know, um, I was speaking. This is when I was still trying to figure out whether or not I would be called a. You know, to Deacons here in the archdiocese who have been trained here in the archdiocese sometime within the last uh, 15 years or so. And I mentioned something about that. I don't know exactly how it came up. But this was in separate conversations. Mm -hmm. Three different deacons all told me that they were instructed specifically during their diaconal formation that Latin was to be avoided and shunned and, and shut out as much as possible. Um, and that's what that's what they were officially told during their formation. And I was wondering, you know, if it was one person that said that to me, I said, well, maybe he misunderstood. But it was three separate people who were told that. And I don't get the impression that that's what, you know, deacons are being taught now in mm -hmm. formation here in the archdiocese. And so, you know, I guess piggybacking on the previous question, you know, where did that come from? And why was that being taught formally? Uh, in these, you know, in, in, in formation, you know, in clerical formation, in direct contradiction to, to what the council intended. Yeah, so, um, what I would say on that is, is there was, um, so kind of back to, to Bill's question, we, we I was swung the pendulum maybe too far and got the vernacular introduced, uh, maybe to an extent that wasn't desired by the council. Uh, the problem with that is that it's kind of hard to put the genie back in the bottle. And so there's there's this fear that if there's this top-down uh, approach um, that that people like in, in you know the pastor, for example, just shows up like, oh, we're gonna start doing things Latin. That there's gonna be this kind of 
rejection of the faithful or the faithful are going to be like, oh, I can't like, I'm going to go somewhere else. So there's this general maybe concern about, the, the, about that being, being forced upon the faithful. Um, what you see in a lot of instances um, is that it's the faithful who are going to the priest and saying, hey, we'd like to see more Latin. Hey, we'd like to see Latin here. Um, and if that happens, the priest is well within their rights to be able to, okay, my, my flock's saying they want to do the Sanctus in Latin. We're going to do that in Latin. And the bishops are usually in support of that, and the priests, they've asked for it. Okay, if your people want it, great. Let's go ahead and do it. Um, so I think it's more out of that fear side of, you know, they, they wanted to, to, again, keep it from being top-down, hoisted upon the people. But I know, like, for example, um, St. Charles, Borromeo Parish, they'll have some Latin, some of their masses in the weekends, and I know, I know the people um, within the parish who have kind of spearheaded some of that, that asking of the priest to bring that stuff back. Um, and in fact, you know, one of the things that, that um, I've heard a few people talk about potentially St. Peter is, you know, hey, maybe we should do the, the um, uh, intro to the readings, you know, um, you know, so when I go through the gospel, you know, Lord be with you, you know, I'm just so biscuit, do that in Latin. If the people want that, you know, Father's going to respond to that. Okay, if people have wanted to ask for this, this to be done in Latin, sure, we'll do that in Latin. You know, we'd like to see Latin, we'd like to see Latin implemented for this part of the Mass or that part of the Mass. Um, he's very open to it. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's also been very clear he's not going to force it on anybody. Yeah. And, uh, he said, if you ask for it, then they'll do it. He's, he's very open to that. He'd be very happy to do it. Yeah. And, and for people, you know, um, I know you guys have been here for a while, right? If I remember correctly, yeah. So, I mean, if I remember correctly, Father Cook didn't do every Mass at Orientum. Um, and in fact, that was something that people asked Father Brahmer to do. He wasn't going to really do every Mass at Orientum, but people asked for it. And so again, he's like, okay, people have asked for it. And that's why the bishop doesn't have an issue with us doing that here, because people have asked for it. That people have wanted that to be done. So, okay. Um, so again, it, we, we've... One of the things that, that uh, Cardinal Ratzinger kind of laments, and I mentioned that before, is that there was a lot of, there was a lot of top downness in this process. You know, I mean, there was a lot of stuff that was pushed down on the people from the, the hierarchy in the church through also the church reform. And that's one of the things he laments is that it wasn't organic like it maybe it had been in the past. Um, and so so certainly I think there's maybe a fear to to reorient things with a top-down approach. So they want to see more of a groundswell uh, from, from the bottom up. And I think it's one of the things that, that Carl Ratzinger had hoped for by liberalizing the use of the uh, um, extraordinary form of the mass, the TLM, that that, that would... More people would experience that, would experience some of those things that that had been removed, and perhaps there'd be a little bit more of a groundswell and and across you know enrichment between the two liturgies to, to help each other. You know, when I was, uh, I think it come to maybe six or seven masses, um, and one I went to a morning mass here, and there was a gentleman on the other side of the church, and there's parts of the mass were said in, in Latin. And he was just as loud as he could be in English. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, as a Protestant, almost, almost buttonholed him at the end of the mass. You know, just saying, dude. So not only does he speak so the, the stuff in English, but he also uses the uh, pre-2008 change in the translation. Yeah. So he speaks in the old translation. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. God bless him. I mean, he gets out of Mass, and he used to come, when we have the 645 Mass the weekdays, he used to be here at all that all the time. So God bless him. He's at Mass. Yeah, I can't, you know, complain about that, but I know exactly what you're talking about. That was weird. Yeah. Weird yep. It's interesting. <laughs> so any other questions? Thank you again. You're welcome. All right. Let's close with a quick prayer. I lose my voice here. Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good gracious God, as we come to the close of our time today, we just give you praise and thanks for the glory of this day and this chance to come together and continue to do our exploration of the Mass. We ask, Lord, that you be with everybody as they depart this evening. We'll allow them to travel home safely and keep us all safe until we can gather again as brothers and sisters in Christ to continue this journey that you've placed us on. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.